spent some time and took some of our leaders to a Mark uh, uh, Learning Lab recently. Um, I, I, it was a day and a half after spending um, an hour or so with our operating committee to talk about what privilege meant um, with the organization White Men as Full Diversity Partners, spent some time with us on that. Um, and, and it was really uplifting in regards to what your organization is doing to be able to help companies like us to be able to dip themselves in the inclusion piece. So I'd like for you to kind of start us off and tell us how is Catalyst working that and what are they doing to be able to help other organizations and what do you see as some success factors yeah. in regards to going down that avenue. Right. All right, great. Thank you, Kevin, for having me here. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Catalyst, we are a large global nonprofit research organization in the area of looking at barriers to advancement of underrepresented talent in the workplace. Obviously, we use women as a proxy. Uh, but in doing that, we recognize that if you cannot be inclusive of 50% of the population with women, you're not going to be inclusive of the five. So that is why our focus still continues to be on that. And for years, we looked at the barriers and we said, how can we fix the barriers in the workplace? And organizations have been doing that as well. And really what has evolved over the, the past even three to four years in companies is the recognition that you can throw policies and programs and activities out there all the time to try to fix exclusionary things, but really what you need to do is change the culture to drive inclusion. And in doing that, in changing the culture, you have to change individual behaviors. And so Catalyst took a step back and said, wait a minute, you know, we've been throwing programming and policies at trying to get women more sponsorship opportunities, get them into the hot jobs, et cetera, but we weren't addressing the fact that we were not focusing on culture change. And, and that is where the programming that you're referencing, that Kevin was referencing, it's called Men Advocating Real Change, we call it MARC for short, uh, evolved. It was based out of our research on why men are not engaged in gender and equity discussions in the workplace. And really, this goes back to the idea of building the inclusion piece, that if you're not engaging the dominant group in the workplace, and in the case, it's 85% of all senior executives and all co corporations globally are white men. And we, we saw the data of just what Houston is <laughs> uh, from there. And these numbers aren't changing, that we've left this group out. And I think, I don't remember if it was Ray or Gordon, whoever brought it up earlier, the idea that you need to engage the dominant group in order to make change in the workplace. And so this programming really looks at the idea of changing individual behaviors. And by doing that, you have to have people be able to change their filters on life. And that's everybody. That's me. That, that's anyone else here in this room. Is We all have our pre-set filters based on our experiences, our backgrounds, what we like, what we don't like. We call it stereotypes and biases. Uh, obviously, that's all in there in the workplace, but the only way you can choose to change that is to bring the awareness, but then more importantly, bring the acceptance to it and the attention to it and the action around it. We've all been stuck kind of on this awareness mm -hmm. piece, and so our, our MARC programming is really taking it to the action component, helping people understand that they have filters so that when they are leading a team or they are on a team, even as the newest employee in an organization, what are they doing that it might be excluding someone unintentionally in, in the activity or the, or the program or the, I'm sitting in a meeting and a male brings up the idea to what she just pointed out in that discussion. And that can be anyone. You can be an introvert and you have a million great ideas in your head, but you don't spit them out as quickly as an extrovert does in the workplace. This isn't about you know, only being visible identities as that question came in from Yammer. And so the MARC programming brings that awareness, brings that, that filter changing component to the organization. And it looks at what we've identified as four inclusive leadership behaviors that drive change in the workplace. Our research continues to show that when leaders are inclusive, their teams will drive innovation. They'll, they'll attribute 40% growth and in innovation to that, those inclusive leader behaviors in the organization. And they drive about 40% in the employee engagement. And we all know from a business standpoint, that's where we all want to be. Right, right. Um, and these inclusive leadership behaviors are what they work on in this programming as well as the filters component. And they're empowerment, accountability, courage, and humility. And I would like to thank uh, you for the, earlier today bringing the courage and humility to your opening speech this morning. 
and really addressing you know, the reality of what is here and what needs to change. It takes that courage and humility from the senior leaders to bring about that change and for anyone on a team to understand your people and understand how they think and be humble and courageous in how you, you approach your team. Gotcha, thank you. Janet, I, I, I wanna take it to, a, uh, to another level. Mm -hmm. um, say that an organization has adapted some of these principles and some of these uh, behaviors mm -hmm. that Martha talked about. Um, and you've worked with many organizations out there in this in this um, mm -hmm. DNI um, uh, path in regards to what we're doing in this space. What have you seen that uh, th with companies that have worked and where they have had shortcomings relative to being successful in DNI? Sure, absolutely. And thank you, thank you, Kevin, for having me. Just in terms of the perspective that I bring, um, my name is Janet Smith. I'm one of the founders of Ivy Planning Group. We are a 28-year-old firm one of the largest firms doing diversity strategy. And I will talk, I will name some of my clients and then not attribute the great things or the bad things to any of them. But <laughs> just to give you an idea of the kinds of companies that we work with, it is Nike and L'Oreal and Morgan Stanley and Lockheed Martin, Rockwell Collins and Johnson Controls. So Ivy is intentionally, has always been intentionally cross-sector, across industry, about 35% gov. We are behind the scenes doing the organizational assessments, understanding the sensitive data, and building the strategies and then helping companies to execute. So in term, and having done this 28 years, I must say that diversity and inclusion work is harder than it's ever been, ever. And there are a couple of reasons around that. One reason is I really think that there has been progress. Um, however, there's also been more polarity, and I'm talking about globally, because most of our clients are multinationals. And so the conversation around diversity tends to actually build this divide versus this inclusiveness, because one challenge is people struggle with this concept of both and. We could be talking about women and men. We could be talking about diversity and inclusion. We could be talking about millennials and Xers and boomers, but for some reason, and I think you mentioned it, Gregory? Gordon, 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 Gordon. who's a G, is we tend to just go 180 degrees. We go here, we do a great job, and then we forget the other side. We've got to get good at that. So that's one of the challenges. The other thing is that there's still a lot of myths in terms of diversity means less than. We have to lower our standards to have anything different. And we like programs. We really like programs, and yet we need systems and process to drive change. I have never ever in 28 years seen diversity success without a committed top leader. I almost cried when you talked yet. Seriously, and I'm not like a really touchy-feely person. <laughs> I'm just not, but okay. <laughs> but, but you so clearly stated why it matters to you, why it matters to the company, what you expect of everyone, and what you wanna go do. That's what we need from, we need that message, but then we need to actually embed diversity and inclusion into systems. Programs are nice. You know, I have seen rice and beans in the cafeteria for diversity programs. I have seen diversity fashion shows, cookbooks, mess. That's, that might make people feel good. You know, I love a good wine and cheese. I've been to diversity inclusion wine and cheeses, all right? I love that. But what we really need is embedding diversity and inclusion into our operations, our processes. That's how you drive change. And so in terms of um, things that, you know, uh, one of the biggest challenges is, is, is actually, as we make progress, is that the pace of play isn't right. We just did work for a client that was doing a great job around recruiting and promoting, and then we did the, the, the regression analysis and the data crunching, and they were able to see that they would not get equity in terms of what the bottom of the organization looked like. Compared to the top, they would not get equity for 98 years. 
98 years with regard to gender, 111 years with regard to black. And it just goes on and on. Again, you have to cut the data. You just can't take, even for engagement, okay, 90% 90, 90 of the people are happy. You have to cut the data. How are the millennials feeling? You know, how are we feeling in Asia? How are we feeling in the UK? How are we feeling at these different locations? If you don't cut it, it's really meaningless. And so we have to approach this like we approach the business. We get the data, we build a process, we monitor the process, we hold people accountable, we break it into pieces, and we wanna innovate. It means that we let go of the old to do the new because you know what? It's gonna drive revenue and it's gonna drive profit. So why do we wanna engage? Why would white men care about this? White men who care about this business care about it. White men who say, I wanna have the very best people care about it. White men who right now are excluded because they don't fit care about it because if it's a meritocracy, they get the opportunity because now it doesn't matter if they fit. It matters if they can perform. So when it comes down to it, this is about business. And if you want to continue to be relevant, you better get on board with this. Or you're going to, we are just going to lose so many of our companies because we're ignoring the real talent and focusing on the wrong things. So that's what I've seen work. Um, our best clients won't even talk about it. They won't even give away their competitive advantage. They won't tell you what they're doing. I have clients that are hyping their programs and never talking about what's really working because what's working is internal business process. You won't give away your secrets about your best processes and when you do this well, I bet you don't share that either. And kudos to you. Just go, <laughs> go get your talent, go get your profit. And I look forward to working with you to do that. Well, I, I have to at least share with Ray because, you know, okay. he did say, you know, he has shared a lot with me, so I at least have to return the favor. What are you holding that back, way. Ray? What are you holding back? <laughs> but, but, I, but I think your point is well taken, and I talked about that initially in the opening program from a standpoint of our, you know, our corporate programs and processes. Yes. It is important for us to be intentional to make sure we get our processes correct and yes. to be able to check those processes along the way. And Justin and I were actually talking about that as we were talking and Ray and the panel was talking to being intentional and stop checkpoints yes. along the way to be able yeah. to figure that out. And I think it's gonna be important for us to do that. Mm -hmm. So Vani, as I think about processes and you guys have this incredible BRG program um, at uh, BP and, and, and I will say we are going to have an incredible BRG program at Bechtel too, as we're revamping. But I'd like to understand, when we talk about processes, how are your BRGs helping BP work through the processes to make sure you guys are doing what you need to do from a DNI perspective? So you're right, Kevin. Our, our BRGs are incredible. Mm -hmm. I'm only slightly biased. <laughs> no, I'm biased. I, I love our, our business resource groups. But before I start, I wanted to step back for a moment. I want to acknowledge the fact that you as leaders stayed in the room for the entire conversation. A lot of times we see people come in, they do their intro, and then they walk out and they don't actually participate in the discussion. So the fact that you've carved out enough time to stay in the room is a powerful message to all the people that work with you. And I encourage you to keep doing that. Um, the second thing is, I like to think of the work that I do in the business resource groups as an extension of my life purpose. So my life purpose is making sure people feel like they belong and that they matter. And in our business resource groups, we have two distinct things that we do. The first is universal. It's making sure that people feel like they belong. And the second is we drive value for the business. And we don't, and I love the way you said both and. We don't engage in either or conversations. If you belong, you're profitable. If you feel included, you're extremely profitable. So I like to say diversity is profitable, but inclusion is extremely profitable. So I'm happy to talk to you from my head or my heart because both of them are completely in line. My head is tied to profitability and shareholder value, which I know our business resource groups do. My heart is tied 
to the people that make us an amazing place to work. And by the way, those are productive people who don't leave, who work longer hours, who feel like they have equal opportunities. And so we make sure that we maintain a balance. We talk about the outcomes that our business resource groups do. So while we say, yes, it would be great to have a cultural awareness event, the question I ask all our business resource groups is, so what? That's right. So what? Yep. So what that you, you know, have a little bit of chicken tikka masala. What does that mean about working with an Indian? Right. Other than the fact it's really good. Right. Um, good food. It's good food, right? Yeah. But then I challenge my community that says, why are we only talking about chicken tikka masala or samosas? Why aren't we talking about the value of our culture? Why aren't we talking about thousands of years of learning how to coexist, learning how to work in a family framework, learning how to embed respect up and down generations? Why aren't we bringing these values into the conversation and saying, hey, BP, I can teach you how to be more inclusive. Take a look at my cool culture. So for me, it's about making sure that each one of our business resource groups, regardless of the diversity dimension that they come from, speak from a position of power. That they speak from a position that I have an equal playing space. I matter and you matter. And if you don't see that I matter, don't worry, I'll help you figure it out. Right? I don't have to put you down, I'll just bring you up with me. And so I think as people of color, sometimes we, we get carried away with this, right, this emotional tax, this, this bag of rocks that we carry where it's like, oh my goodness, they're gonna think, oh, there's the Indian woman on that panel, can she speak English? Mm. She's got the dot on her forehead, so I love to say, let's address the dot in the room. Oh, I love it. Anyone has a question, come talk to me, I'm happy to explain it. But Ray and I always love, you know, Ray goes and he explains to people that he's black. <laughs> and I like to tell people I'm brown. And he says, well, you know, Vani, everyone calls me articulate. And I said, well, I'm working my way up to articulate. Usually I get congratulated for speaking English. <laughs> so articulate's a step up, right? So it's making sure that when we have these conversations that those that are not the majority and those who are the majority actually come together at an equal level. And so when we talk about diversity and inclusion, I just like to say, let's level the playing field. I have always run the same race. I have always been in the competition. What you didn't notice though is I was 10 yards back. And all I'm asking is that you just bring me to the starting line and allow me to keep running that race. So that's a little bit of personal history, but also what I do in the business resource groups. But I've been part of the business resource groups the entire time I've been at BP for 15 years. Okay. Great. Take off Great. On this both sure. and thing. Sure. <laughs> not, not, not to change the conversation. No. But we like, we like we both like, and. I like this both yeah. and. Um, yeah. And I wanted to take it from research from both what you said and you said. Um, when Catalyst looks at this idea of both and, there are a couple places where this filters in. And to your point, we did research on what does the word inclusion mean to employees? I mean, we throw this word around everywhere. I mean, what it means for me might be different than somebody else. And what we actually found globally, and we were surprised that it was a global definition, is that people both felt that they were, their uniqueness was celebrated, that they could bring their unique ideas, skills, background traits, whatever it is, to the table, and it was listened and valued and heard, but that they also belonged. And employee resource groups, business resource groups, whatever you want to call them, fit into that equation perfectly in bringing that to the organization. And what we always coach companies is, is, is you don't want your ERGs to become exclusionary in an echo chamber of themselves because then you're celebrating uniqueness mm -hmm. and you've lost the belongingness yep. component to the larger part of the organization and so that you bring this back to both of them where you work together. And we always, we always use that example, it, so many times in diversity people are talking over each other's heads and the conversations are going over, you need to be with each other in the rooms together doing that, and that's how you get change, is by, and, if, and I always use the example of elephant and mouse. An elephant cannot tell you anything about a mouse. It, it doesn't know it, it's irrelevant to its life. A mouse can tell you everything about the elephant, it's every move, it's every breath, how it sleeps, how it eats, because at any minute, it 
could be squashed by the elephant by accident. And that's really what the dominant and non-dominant groups in the workplace are and the role of employee resource groups in the workplace are is to have that understanding and that learning of the elephant in the room, learning and, and understanding the mouse in the room and what it brings to the table and brings apart. And then the both end, when you talked about it, our employee, uh, I mean, our day-to-day -day experiences research shows that employees experience inclusion and exclusion at the same time in the workplace all day, every day. It's not an either or, it's a both and, but they can't describe inclusion. Because why? We have spent all of our careers focusing on exclusion. And we have not celebrated the inclusion. We have not modeled the inclusion. We've not worked through the inclusive behaviors on the teams. And so that both and component shows up in this research. Uh, they can't describe it. The only thing that they do to get close to it is say, well, we have a diverse team. Well, that's not inclusion, to your point. It's a number, not the action. Or that they have a personal connection with their supervisor. And that's the only inclusionary thing they can give a concrete example. And people leave supervisors, not firms. Uh, and once you get them into the company, getting them in is a whole nother recruiting <laughs> issue. Um, but on the other hand, they see tokenism, policies, and programming that don't match the culture of the organization and stereotypes and biases, the microaggressions that you mentioned, you know, being called articulate or, or saying, wow, you actually speak English really well, you know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, they're quick to point out those every day. And so we need to balance and bring the both up and celebrate the inclusionary part. And that's one of the things our MARC programming helps to address. How do I, as a senior leader, how do I as a white male, or how do I as a white female, and I'm in our Asia offices, how do I model inclusion in my specific examples and, and visibly demonstrate that day to day because it starts at the top? Yeah. Yeah. One thing about the inclusion piece is um, insiders understand inclusion. So there, there is an element of inclusion in organizations because we've really always understood how to be inclusive mm -hmm. until we introduce the difference. And so sometimes it is when we study insiders and how they're experiencing organizations, we're actually able to define what inclusion means in an organization, then start to introduce the, because you really can't have inclusion without diversity. It's like, you know, it's a country club. So, so you study inclusion, what it looks like for insiders, and then you start to experiment with introducing dimensions of diversity. And sometimes it's really, sometimes it's doing the same thing with different people. Sometimes it is altering it, but it's, um, it's an interesting phenomenon, this inclusion thing. Yeah. But Kevin, the, the, the cool part of it is belongingness is universal. Mm. Yep. And it's so easy to understand. If you ask a five-year-old, do you feel like you matter? They may not understand the word matter, right. but do you feel like you belong? Mm. They can tell you clearly yes or no. An adult, regardless of how technical or non-technical he or she is, you can ask the simple question, do you feel like you belong? And if they say no, you've got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. And if they say yes, then you've got a lot of work to do because mm -hmm. <laughs> you need to figure out how to yeah. replicate right. that. Exactly, right. exactly. Duplication. So I, I want to I go to a different spot, but kind of uh, intersect where we were going. We've got the BRG space here. Um, we've got uh, excellent programming out there, similar to what, you know, for what we're doing at Catalyst. Um, there's a phase where we take our white men through some segments and go there. We bring um, females into the mix, multicultural people, blacks, Latinos, Asians. We start having the discussions, right? We can get off and we can have some lean in circles like Ray had talked about. We want to get there. I've, at Bechtel, we've got some very hungry motivated employees that are leading our BRG groups are in that space and there's an intersection right right mm -hmm. you know we can't go fast enough to make all of this happen because we want to have change immediately that's how important it is yeah. right so although I'm a baby boomer I function at a speed of a millennial, but then I get a little tired, but right. I still got to allow them to catch up right but I don't want them to keep going because I have to tell them slow down 
So I, I'm interested to see how do we manage that? How does an organization mm -hmm. manage that? Because because it's amazing to have, mm -hmm. but you got to have that sweet spot to make sure you be become successful. Because I always have to tell our teams you can't go down this the the, the lane too fast because if you're not successful, you won't have the galley follow. So we need to make sure we do that. So just some, some advice in regards to making sure we go down that path correctly. Well, I think the biggest thing, um, one, is that anything you do in DNI needs to be tied to the business objectives of the company. And right. it needs to be vocally said day in and day out. I, I think that's always been a, a common mistake a lot of organizations make. They have DNI separate over here. They have their own mm -hmm. objectives. Mm -hmm. They have their own programming. Uh, and it's not tied to the business. And when it's tied to the business, you have more universal acceptance of right. it too right. they're, they're in that part. But it's also recognizing that in doing this, you're gonna have uncomfortable and people are not gonna be, you know, they're gonna be baby steps right. in this. Right. So it is unfortunately slower than we always want it. Right. But it's about having those difficult conversations and about being able to step back, and, and I don't remember who said it earlier, I, I think it was Kyle, the idea that safety, and, and research is called psychological safety, precludes inclusion, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. the other way around, mm -hmm. and that you have to have the safe environments and the culture of the organization to be accepting of those conversations. Right. And the companies that we find that are able to have those conversations, the conversations started at the top, and the organization recognized it was okay for me to have this difficult conversation. Now, okay. there are tool, we have tools, obviously, right, to help right, with right. that. We have research on what it is. Most people, you would go in and assume, assume positive intent. Most people don't realize what they're doing, you know, the impact right. versus intent right. uh, component. And when you start having these discussions, as an organization, you have to make sure you don't get into the misalignment and the setbacks and all that come with it. Otherwise, you take those 10 steps back as you go. Exactly. But unfortunately, small, small and, and people react to the small group type of discussions. I can have a much better discussion with a small group of people to really be able to feel safe in what I'm talking about. Okay. And we're finding, um, and Chevron's vocal about it, so I can talk about it in front of VP and everyone else. You know, to your point, we <laughs> to like your Chevron. point, not, we yeah. like Chevron. Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, we do uh, too. We do too. Been, um, uh, you know, working in these areas, so is Deloitte and others, where they're finding that these small group discussions really are making an impact in the business. Um, I was out in a, a consulting firm that was doing small group discussions, and in one of their remote locations. And seven of the, the millennial males, white males, I will say, sitting there at the table were talking about what they had learned in the discussions and how helpful it was with them when they went back to their teams. And I, to me, that was success. To see something out, out in the field, out at the mid-levels, not anywhere near the corporate office training programs. It was a grassroots effort uh, that they had started and done okay. through that programming, yeah. Kevin, I'd like to add a caveat to that also. One is, um, so when Ray came in as our chief diversity officer, he said there were a couple of things that were really, really important to him. So as you heard this morning about real talks and small conversations, guess what? Those take time. Mm -hmm. A lot of time. And so when we say as senior leaders, I want to see increased visibility, I want to see increased engagement, that comes with an understanding that engagement takes time. That means that you at the top have to give the space to the middle to have those conversations and put that on par with their P&L. Mm -hmm. Because if you tell your middle, I need you to deliver your performance contract, where are they going to have time for conversations? Mm -hmm. yep. Where are they going to bring their people in and ask them if they feel included if all they're looking at is meeting their quarterly objectives? Right. And so. The one thing we need to understand is this takes space and it takes time. And if you try to ROI everything to death, diversity will fail. Mm -hmm. Some of the conversations that we have in these small groups around race, sexual orientation, women of color, um, the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, whatever it is that that group needs to talk about, that one person who stays is a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you just want to think about if you're a, 
a diversity practitioner in this room, I just want you to think about that one conversation you had that made someone stay. Mm -hmm. And recognize that when somebody asks you what value you deliver, just count those numbers and just multiply it by 200,000 and see where it fits into your P&L. Thank you. So I, I know we can probably have this discussion for at least another two hours. Can I just say one thing? I'll let you say one thing. Let me just say one thing. And you know, I'm, I'm a consultant, so I'm, I'm accustomed to people disagreeing with me. So it's all right. All right. Um, these things do take time, but the pace of play matters a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the diversity and inclusion space, we are too comfortable with the length of time this is taking. Mm -hmm. And we're being now overcome by, we have a crisis situation and we're not treating it as such. We wouldn't, we, think about how much time you would give yourself around a revenue problem or a profit problem. Mm -hmm. That's what this is and we need to address it as such. Right. And so we think about how do we tackle problems. We don't use the problem word I know a lot in business particularly around people things, mm -hmm. but it's a problem. So we need to understand the problem, understand the solution, the path, as you say, and then address it as such. And it just, it can't take so long. One, one ex quick example, there was a woman on the, U on the UK panel who talked about um, a requirement to have a number of years experience for a job. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that some of my clients do is really examine, why are we saying we need 10 years of experience here? Mm -hmm. Is that a preference or is that a requirement? Mm -hmm. Is it really a requirement? What is it that you learn in 10 years that you don't learn in five? And does somebody with 20 years experience necessarily know how to do that well? Mm -hmm. All right. So let's figure out how to really evaluate whether somebody has a skill and then if it's a brand new skill, then let's decide who, could, who has the potential to learn it. Mm -hmm. Those are the, that's why we need executives involved, because they're the ones that can make the call on that mm -hmm. and say we're going to do a new thing and we're going to do it now because we have a problem. Mm -hmm. And if we let it take, I've been doing this for 28 years. In many cases, we, have, we are down. We have gone back. Mm -hmm. And we have to, we're going to get it right one way or another. Mm -hmm. And the another is scary. Right. So, so the key thing is being intentional. Being intentional. The next, the next thing is someone making the call to do it. Yes. Right? And then the third thing, which you probably don't realize, is I always have Jack Future there to answer to. So I have to do it like yesterday. Yes. <laughs> That's what it takes. Not a couple of months down the road. So I yep. definitely agree. Yeah. So. And, and her point that you have to keep yeah. working at it, I yeah. think, is critical. But to. our research yeah. shows it takes seven to 20 years to yeah. change culture. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to Woo. open it up for questions. Any questions in the room? Um, any on YAM or anything out there? Kelly, in the room? In the room? I know you guys have a dying pressing. Yes, uh, there's a mic come around to you, Rodney. Thanks. So um, you talked about the BRG groups and again, groups we have here. And um, you know, there, there's a number of them. So since they're kind of groups of people who are alike, how do you work them together such that they are then inclusive as well um, going forward? And then how are their voices heard at the management levels? That's a great question. What I'll say just first to start is it depends. When you're starting out, you want to bring that coalition of like minds together because that's how you build that belongingness. So in our journey in BP for years and years and years, we allowed these organizations to build and grow around that specific diversity dimension. Now, after a decade of what we consider progress, we're now looking at intersectionalities. Mm -hmm. So how do we bring these different diversity dimensions together as well as drive more value for the company? So um, our LGBTQ group, Pride, did a, an event with our veterans group and they had a person of color, right. right? All three groups get to come together. All three groups get to talk about the nuances that are important to their community. But the business then sees, 
ah, this is what working together looks like. So it's not just a, let me tell you, we actually show. And I think there is a, a great point there in terms of your voice. The company does not have time to hear 500 individual voices. And so when we come together powerfully as 12 national business resource groups, then we coalesce into what we call the BRG family. And then our BRG family feeds into Ray, who sits on our National Diversity Council. So our Diversity and Inclusion Council has all of our senior most leaders. So we go in as BRGs and say, here are my top two or three things for my specific group. And then when we synthesize that, here are the top two or three priorities for the BRG family. And bringing the idea of bringing the the BRG, what business value can you add? I always challenge the groups to be able, everything that you do, be able to articulate, oh, better not use that word, sorry, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> um, be back. able to speak to what, how this group can help the organization mm -hmm. achieve these objectives. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, that is in itself your selling point and your elevator pitch mm -hmm. for it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a question? Uh, quick question on with regard to uh, the, the the statement you made about change of culture seven to twenty years, um, and I really love to hear the consultant's uh, take on this. Uh, one of the one of the <laughs> one of the issues we've had uh, at the senior levels when you start trying to replace senior folks, um, we get into rooms, and I've sat on a ton of search committees for this type of stuff. We get into rooms where the first thing we one of the things we talk about is we want a diverse pool, right? And there's one statement that comes up at some point in that conversation that kills all of that, and that is, we need to find people at like institutions in like positions. And all of a sudden, you drain it from there. Um, thoughts about, about those type of scenarios that continue culture? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, one of the things that we pay attention to when that happens is, look, is looking at the facts. The facts and data are friends. And so we'll say, well, let's look at other people we've brought over at high positions. And quite often, it is people that the executives trusted, they knew in another life, they believed that they're going to come through for me. And quite often, that was outside of the industry. Or they're going to now be standing up a whole new division that's brand new, and you couldn't have those kinds of skills. It's why at the very top, it, it's, it's what drives the change. You know, I think of Bob Ben Moshe, who passed away um, a few years ago, was the CEO of MetLife and then AIG, and he passed away. He decided he was going to do this. He spoke very much the way, the way you do, um, Jack. And he made the decision, and so he would just disrupt things that were anti the decision, you know. The promotions came through, they would all happen the same time of year, the huge promotions. He looked at it, he didn't like the way it looked, and he said, there'll be no promotions. And he said, you're gonna go out to the headhunters, you're gonna find people. We're gonna really interview a diverse slate. And they said, well, the headhunters can't bring a diverse slate. So he brought the headhunters in and said, if you can't do this, you're not gonna, we're not, you're not gonna be our headhunters anymore. And a miracle happened. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how all of a sudden, they found it. And so it's um, it's systemic change takes a long time for it to be baked in, but change can happen quickly. We see that in mm -hmm. business. We change. We're talented, and then it builds into the process, and it's sustainable. Mm -hmm. so, Sustainability you know. is the key. Yeah, I believe. I had someone. Uh, I had someone ask that question. I, I, I wasn't the responder, but the, the person's response was, "The research shows that 65% of kids starting school today will be in jobs that do not exist. That's right. When they yep. get to work. So why would you be hiring the old needs when you should be hiring people that are? To I, I think Vani pointed it out. The ones that have the potential to learn and grow and develop. And those may come from other places, other resources yep. from there. I thought that was a great response to him. Yeah. And, and I think one of the quick questions that we can turn around and ask is, do you sponsor a person of difference? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you don't, why don't you? It's almost like the reverse mentoring, right? 
-hmm. Are you mentoring someone that doesn't look like you right. or someone of another gender? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And our engagement. But let's sponsor them for, and bring right. them and along. And sponsor right. them as well. Right. Right. You can right. mentor me all right. day long, but I if can stay in my same position. Right. Yep. Go ahead exactly. and sponsor me. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> sponsorship. I think I got your point there, yeah. Bonnie. Sponsorship. There you go. <laughs> sponsorship <laughs> is the number one way right. for career advancement. I was hoping it wouldn't take too long, Kevin. What do you say about me when we're in the room? You're doing the nine box. I don't know her. Well, that's death. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Uh, any questions from Yammer? Kelly, can we take a question from Yammer? Uh, we have a question. Uh, what's the best way of sustaining a community with different cultural points of view, and how do you avoid potential conflicts? Okay. You want to start with that? Or? Yeah. Um, Having the difficult conversations um, is the most critical part of this. And, and our research and engaging in difficult conversations takes it from the standpoint of what do I need to do, that person having it. And that's always one starting with assuming positive intent. If you go into that discussion with positive intent. The other part is, in part of the inclusive leadership behaviors, is the courage and the humility to learn and grow from others and not say you're the be all end all and the know all of everything, mm -hmm. whether it's on your team or other people you know. And we find that in that, that allows you to have those conversations and that builds those personal connections um, you know, from a research mm -hmm. standpoint. Mm -hmm. and, and it's critical. The other, the other part of it is back to that psychological safety and having, that, having a culture that allows that to learn and grow from the others as well. We've also seen having, having different groups come together to tackle a problem. So there is a, a common mission, a common mm -hmm. thing we're trying to do, and understanding that we're going to disagree, we're going to argue, we're going to bring different views, but we're all trying to do the same thing. And most of the time, if you think about people that you have a relationship who are very different from you, quite often you have the relationship because you went through something together. Mm -hmm. You know, you went through a difficulty, and now, you know, it's... Now we know each other, and so uh, so putting together putting people together on teams to to tackle a, any kind of problem is a great way yeah. to accomplish that. But I, I, I do go ahead. No, I was just going to add some. Go ahead. I do have to say though, intersectionality is messy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So if we want very clean boxes that say everything is going to be comfortable, polite, easy, no. And if we embrace the messy, I have a social group that we speak a dozen languages. If you were to come and hang out with us, you wouldn't think anyone was talking to anyone else <laughs> because there are a dozen languages going on. We all come together and then we move apart and we have different conversations. But I think the one thing we don't do is leverage the strengths of each community. So for example, in STEM, I like to argue that Asian communities do not focus on STEM because it is actually genetically programmed. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I don't know what it's like to study STEM, because mm -hmm. no one ever told me that. Mm -hmm. right. right? So I say, let's take people from my community and go to a community that doesn't have that and learn from each other. Right. I come from a community that takes care of family. Nobody has to ask me where my parents are going to go. My parents are going to be with me. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about what caregiving looks like in the workplace, come talk to an Asian. Mm -hmm. right? So as we're figuring out things, why don't we look to the strengths that each community brings and then exploit those in a very good way or leverage those intersectionalities. Those differences, intersectionalities, yeah. great. I was just well, gonna add one research point because we kept talking about millennials earlier and baby boomers and since you and I fall in the baby mm -hmm, boomer category, mm -hmm. research shows that on teams, the millennials and the Gen Zs and all are comfortable with conflict. Their managers yeah. are not. True. Think about the dynamic that's going on on those teams. And, and therein lies a big problem, you know, back to that point mm -hmm. of it. it the, the younger generations see conflict as a way to get the best results right. out. Then the research shows that it, it, teams that are diverse aren't as comfortable with their decision that they've made, but they end up with the better decision yeah. Yeah. because mm -hmm. the homogeneous team does the group think. Right. In there, exactly. so I just Good point. we were talking about millennials. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Good insight. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you.